Hello and welcome to the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Our guest today is Dr. Brianna Walton, and she's from the Women's Center for Pelvic Health and Arundel Medical Center. Correct. And today we're talking about women's health, as we always talk about, but yeah. we're talking about something that's a, been a little taboo, the word to mention. We're talking about vaginal health. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so a lot of times there's not an instruction book on how to care for yourself in that way. It's not. So a lot of times we make mistakes that end up um, harming us health-wise. Absolutely. I think one of the things that, you know, I've been impressed with is that depending on the age of the woman, um, you ignore that body part. You know, you try to dismiss it and it's not until it causes you problems or symptoms that people tend to pay more attention to it. And that's not the way we are supposed to maintain our health, right? We brush our teeth every day. Yes. So there has to be some sort of oversight to the vagina. Do you find that older women uh, feel that it's more taboo or are the younger women more aware? Absolutely. I think that they are much more comfortable with talking about it and certainly um, maintaining it. And if they have questions about it, they will speak up a little more clearly. Um, but it's still something that tends to be a little taboo, when they, particularly when they start having issues or problems. How should you, uh, as far as the, the daily maintenance, soap or no soap? Well, we, we still say use warm soapy water. You just don't put it in the vagina. But I think the question is also, when you have a problem like a discharge, that's when women start to do a little more heroic activities, like putting soap inside or putting something else inside to get rid of that odor. And the question is, is an odor normal or is it abnormal? And that's what and sometimes it's difficult to figure out. I guess that's the question, is an odor normal or abnormal? And what kind of odor is abnormal? Mm -hmm. So. The telltale signs of bad odors, like bacterial vaginosis, tends to have a really fishy smell. And that has to do with the type of bacteria and causing a release of certain uh, chemicals that cause a fishy odor. Um, there are other abnormal odors that are associated with sexually transmitted diseases that don't really have a characteristic smell, but they have, like, something's not right, and it's constant. Versus the woman who, around the time of her period, always gets a certain particular smell. That just has to do with changes in the pH. So a lot of times when we're doing an exam, you might see increased amount of fluid, and it, we could describe that as a physiologic discharge as opposed to a pathologic discharge, one that's caused by infection. So are women supposed to, do some women just simply have a discharge no matter what? Absolutely because it's based on hormones, it's based on your pH, it's based on your diet, it's based on stress. So all those things really come to play and really there's no other sort of orifice besides your mouth that's gonna sort of tell where you are in your life, right? People sometimes have chronic bad breath and it has a lot to do with your diet and what, what's going on. Same sort of thing for your vagina, it just basically is telling you where you are. How do you start monitoring so you can know what's normal and what's not normal? I think you have to know your normal and there aren't a lot of screening tests out there. I think one of the things we haven't been taught as women is how do you check to make sure you're in balance and there isn't a real um, common test that people will do, but sometimes you can take your own pH. There are some kits out there that are I available. Just saw, mm -hmm. I just saw at a drugstore, I was very surprised to see that. Yeah, so the normal pH of the vagina is on the four range, and so when it starts to raise, we, we associate, associate that more with bacterial or yeast infections. So some of those tests give you a hint. Okay, you might have an abnormal discharge. But most of us don't take the time to sort of say, where, am, where do I normally live? If my pH is normally around a 4.5 and, um, and then I start running a 6, I know that's abnormal versus somebody who normally lives at a 5. Do you recommend, whether you bought a kit or not, you need to go to the doctor? Or do I, you not need to go? Do I you, think do, it depends on how chronic the problem is 
And what other symptoms are associated with it? If you're having pain, absolutely. If you're having urinary issues, absolutely. But if it's just the discharge and you're not quite certain, I think if it just happens around the time of the menstrual period, sometimes we'll say it's probably just related to that. But if it's lingering despite the time of your cycle that you're in, those are times when you need to see somebody just to reassure yourself and us that there's not something silent going on. There are some issues you can have that are sexually related issues opposed to not sexually related issues. Correct. For example, if you have a yeast infection, mm -hmm. that's not related to no, no. sex. So um, there's inflammation, infection, and, and infections can be divided in, as you said, to sexual and non-sexual. Yeast infections fall in, under infection, but that's non-sexual, along with bacterial vaginosis, vaginosis. Um, and they basically change is in the vaginal pH allow certain bacteria to raise or fall, and then the yeast population can raise or fall in regards to that. So sometimes people will find if they have a lot of dairy in their product, their yeast will rise. Or if they are stressed, their, their levels will drop off and they'll start to see other uh, signs or symptoms that maybe they're getting a bacterial infection. But sometimes with some things, there are no signs, and, and I've, I've known women who ended up uh, with issues for years, and then they find out that they're infertile. Years later, something that may have happened as a teenager, or something that wasn't taken care of years ago, and you end up infertile. So one of the things that I think, and you bring up a lot of good points, women, particularly girls, need to be honest about what their activities are. And if they are sexually active, they need to be the guardian of that galaxy, right? <laughs> they need to make sure that they're saying, okay, I have a new sexual partner. I need to be screened beforehand and afterwards to make sure that there's nothing there. And that screening should happen on an annual basis unless you have a new sexual partner. Because some of these, as you mentioned, um, like chlamydia and gonorrhea can happen silently without any kind of infection or, or discharge, and they're, it's wreaking havoc on the entire pelvic organs, blocking the tubes, blocking the uterus, causing scar tissue. And some of those people are going to be a setup for chronic pain for the rest of their life. So because all of the organs are so close together, one thing can always affect the other? Correct. Now, well, and there's no, so for example, if there's something on my hand, I know exactly where it is. I can localize it. But if there's something on the uterus, there's no real nerve to the uterus. There's a complex of nerves. So you might say, I have bladder pain, where somebody else would say, I have back pain. And that's the difficulty is that there's no real localizing effect. They just have general discomfort sometimes. So you're a urogynecologist. So Correct. not only do you deal with the uh, reproductive system, Correct. you deal with the... Um, Lower urinary tract, so the bladder and uh, just uh, urethra. And so much can go wrong mm. <laughs> down there. <laughs> and a lot of things, for example, you were mention, mentioning um, cancers. Mm -hmm. Cancers like ovarian and, and cervical cancers, some of the problems with those cancers is they don't get di diagnosed until it may be too late or it Correct. may be late stage. I mean, all gynecologists, okay, so there are certain subspecialties of gynecology, GYN oncology, general gynecology, and urogynecology. All of us are familiar with screening tests to look for cervical cancer. There aren't any great screening tests, though, for uterine cancer, and there aren't any great screening tests for ovarian cancer. So unfortunately, we just have to base it on our pelvic exams. But you know, from, from our standpoint, we want to make sure that we're looking at that on a regular basis to exclude it, if at all possible. But you know your body better than we do. So if there's something off kilter, that's when we want you to come in and say, hey, something's not right. How, how necessary is it for the vagina to breathe? Hmm. That's an interesting question. And I would say, you know, from an obstructive standpoint, by wearing tight pants or tight underwear, uh, we certainly can see changes in the pH, and that can cause some issues. But 
you know, I think at night when we're sleeping, we tend to not wear underwear or very wear, wear very loose fitting clothing. That just helps to sort of recalibrate the system. So that's your recommendation would be, not, or and then well, too, um, not just that, but does the kind of underwear you wear, does that matter? Whether you're wearing nylon, whether you're wearing cotton, whether you're wearing a mixture of the two, how can that impact I things? think it all depends on you. If you're a person that's more prone to infection or inflammation, you're not going to want to wear something that's more restrictive. You're going to wear want to wear a cotton underwear. You want to if you have a little moisture, you're going to want to change your pad more frequently as opposed to someone who doesn't really have any issues. So I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that they have to wear big granny panties all the time, but that's something that they you know have to know that if they are doing it chronically and they start having issues, they might need to adjust it. How about as we age, um, as far as how, do, how does the, the system, how does the vagina change as you age? Good and what question. should you be looking for? So it's interesting because sometimes the vagina tells us, you know, as, our screen, as a, the screeners, uh, that it's about to change into menopause before you start having other symptoms. Um, a lot of women uh, equate menopause with hot flashes or mood changes or, you know, systemic effects. But we can see when we're doing the vaginal exam, changes in the color, the texture, and the moisture of the vagina about two to three years before that change even happens. So sometimes when woman, a woman comes to me and says, I'm starting to have more urinary symptoms and she's 47, or sex doesn't feel the same, it kind of hurts on insertion. Those are things that sort of point to me, maybe I need to look and see if there is some evidence of that menopause transition with vaginal dryness. Is there something that can be done? Oh, absolutely. Um, even though we're not doing a lot of systemic hormones, you're not taking them by mouth. Yes, because of what happened years ago as right. far as the, the research. The, our, our rates are, are, of, of breast cancer have tremendously dropped as a result of not using a lot of combined hormones. but. Estrogen isn't taboo completely, particularly if you're not putting it in the mouth, but putting it in the vagina. It can have a local effect without having harmful systemic effects. So there are creams out now that can help you deal creams, with that. Creams, tablets, inserts in terms of suppositories, and then there are non-hormonal hormonal ways to sort of adjust if you have vaginal dryness. I use a lot in my practice coconut oil. Really? Absolutely. I love it. And patients are like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, just don't use the one that's in your kitchen. <laughs> Get one and put it in your bathroom and keep it in your bathroom and don't let anybody else use it. But coconut oil enhances the cellular retention of water. And so it holds that moisture in the cell, which is important just in terms of elasticity. But it, there are also some, it's some information out about its maintenance of the vaginal microbiome, keeping the Pounds. number of, of bacteria in line and it being a natural antimicrobial, kind of fighting off infections. It's not meant to be, you know, a fighter for sexually transmitted diseases, but it could help with maintaining that pH. And also you just mentioned as we get older, having symptoms such as dryness, these things can affect um, how, how we perform sexually, Absolutely. or even just the desire to have sex, period. Well, if it hurts, you don't want to have sex, right? It's just one of those things. And it's interesting, I think for women, we're wired such that everything in the universe has to be aligned for you to really, to, you know, women <laughs> use, have sex when they are relaxed. Men use sex to relax. That's the big so, sort of ticket items, the way I see it. And when it hurts, they're not going to relax. Women are, are, are very protective. <laughs> and of course, we don't talk about sexual dysfunction with women like you do. I mean, I can recite the, the Cialis song or whatever song, <laughs> you know, because that stuff comes on TV so often. Absolutely. Okay, but, but we don't hear about women, no. solutions for women no. as often. No, especially in this environment of, you know, hashtag we too, me too. We need to be, like I said, better guardians of the galaxy and be more comfortable. You gotta be comfortable with that vocabulary to speak up about what's happening sort of below the belt. 
if the if there is a discomfort with insertion versus deep discomfort that can mean a very different thing one could mean just vaginal dryness where another could be endometriosis and being able to have a meaningful conversation with your provider to tell them that or you're leaking well when do you leak is it insertion or is it with orgasm just having the comfort to tell your provider this and as a provider to be comfortable to ask those questions because a lot of doctors don't they won't ask when it comes to things like um, uh, how these medications work for example does it help with the whole arousal thing with so there isn't the equivalent of Viagra for women. Okay, so the, yes, that was my question, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so we, we've tried to look for sort of an equivalent, and I think there's some trials out, but there's not really one thing that is sort of key. I have to admit that a lot of times when I'm reviewing people's sexual history, <laughs> it comes down to non-medical things, like relationships. Okay. That tend to be. And like you said, all the stars for women <laughs> have to be aligned in yeah. order <laughs> for you to, to be in the place right. where you can have an enjoyable act. And, you know, some people come to me thinking they need a hysterectomy when they really need a partnerectomy. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I, like, I can't get rid of him. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, I, you know, it's hard sometimes to admit it, but again, you know, we work in a sacred space, and we want to be able to have those conversations that sometimes they've never had with anybody. How do you get, as, as women, how do you get us to open up and tell the doctor, hey, I have these issues, I have these questions, especially mm -hmm. in, uh, with the, the women in a certain generation. Mm -hmm. It's like you're not used to talking like mm -hmm. that. You're not used to using the language. Mm -hmm. But you have some questions and concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, our, our questionnaire kind of covers it, but when I get a patient in a room, I sort of judge where they are in terms of discomfort in general. And I use a lot of humor to try to disarm people. So, for example, I commonly will ask, okay, how long have you been with your partner? And they'll say 30 years or whatever. I say, well, do you still like them? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Because that's a big, you know, factor in terms of just having comfortable intercourse. Are you all active? Well, how often? Okay, is it because of the leakage that you're not active anymore? Is it just because of pain? Why, why, what's changed it? Are you okay with not being active? You know, just being more comfortable with like slowly getting into there and not being judgmental about the question, just trying to fact find. 30 or 40 years ago, uh, a lot of women were douching. Oh, yeah. To I douche remember. or not to douche? No. No, there's why? No, there's, because again, you're trying to rinse away sort of abnormal odors and abnormal smells, and by douching, you sometimes alter the bacterial content. If there's an abnormal odor or discharge, that should be evaluated as opposed to trying to rinse it away. Should the you The vagina use is going to smell like something, okay? And that's okay. It's just when it becomes foul to you or malodorous to your partner or, and, and that's the other thing, is that women are sometimes embarrassed when they are with a partner because they don't know if they have a bad odor or not. And I think to be able to have a conversation with your partner and say, do you think that this is abnormal or not? And, and being comfortable to hear yes or no. What about the products? There are a lot of products out here, sprays and, mm. and powders and things that, that uh, say that they can do away with odors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I like, okay, I will admit, I like certain uh, smells and fragrances and that sort of thing, but I think of them more as like a decoration or jewelry. It's not meant to cover up something bad. It's supposed to enhance your confidence. So if you have a discharge and you think you stink, you're not supposed to like, you know, just take the whole thing of FDS and just, you know, <laughs> push the button and not come off for 50 seconds. You, you're trying to cover up something bad uh, and that needs to be evaluated. But if you're with your partner and you want to just zhuzh it up, that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Do different birth control methods, hmm. um, 
affect the vagina? Yeah, because they're going to alter the hormone content. So, for example, birth control pills regulate the amount of estrogen released from the body, and so particularly the ovary. So instead of having this cyclic levels of estrogen and progesterone, you kind of have a steady state. And so it's going to change the body's response to having this steady state instead of the up and downs. Um, and, and that in itself can alter the way the, because you're, you're still going to have a period, but it's going to alter the way the bacteria respond because the amount of blood loss is going to change. The, um, again, the number of bacteria is going to change in response to those hormones. So it, it can alter it, but not usually in a bad way. What about the cups? I've seen now in pharmacies oh, the cups. That is becoming very popular, and I think you know, one of the things we, that we're paying more attention to is the number of feminine health products, things that are made for us. And the younger generation really appreciates the use of a menstrual cup as opposed to a tampon or a pad. And we're, we're finding them healthy. You just have to follow the guidelines in terms of how often to remove them and then putting in a new one. Is that, is that safe? Yeah, it's safe. It's just you have to follow the guidelines. And so a lot of us, particularly as African-American women, and we've talked about this before, um, have fibroids. And so the yes. volume of bleeding could be very different uh, depending on other things that you have. you have. If you have fibroids or you have sort of the cousin to endometriosis called adenomyosis, the amount of blood that you shed per month is going to be very different than somebody who doesn't. And that menstrual cup may not accommodate it. That's what I was going to ask. If you are a heavy mm -hmm. bleeder, is that going to work for you? It may not. And if you are a heavy bleeder, <laughs> that's one of the things that we want to try to figure out earlier on. What I find is that sometimes women ignore it for a period of time and then the fibroids are too are really big and they impact their ability to have a baby or they are causing discomfort or they come in and their blood count is extremely low because they've been bleeding so much. Which, you know, in the past we were transfusing people a lot. Obviously we don't want to do that anymore. What's so interesting, it's always been interesting to me, how uh, fibroids <laughs> are just epidemic, at an epidemic level with African American women. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with maybe genetics, uh, what we eat, mm -hmm. and things like that. Well, I think it has a lot to do with our diets. I mean. Many are, the thought process is that many of the foods that we eat, say for example, like chicken, um, they've been in, those chickens have been raised in environments that are enhanced with hormones. You ingest the hormones, you're adding to your own personal hormone. It amplifies the cellular production of the fibroid, the, the cells. So you can alter, because we know a, a, a plant-based diet well, is associated with less fibroids. So it's one of those things that we, you know, we we are used to doing what we want to do in, in terms of our diet, and then sometimes we pay for it down the line. There's something I want you to repeat as we um, move toward the end of the show. You mentioned that you need to get checked with every partner. Mm -hmm. That is so important for the young folks. Absolutely. You need to make sure everything is, is okay as you transition from one partner to the next. And I think that's the interesting thing because uh, a lot of women will feel like they're going to be judged if they keep having to go back in and be rechecked. But it, it is imperative that you know where you are. That's your responsibility to your partner. But you also want to know if you have acquired anything from that partner and you want to know their status when you get into a relationship. Is it true what they say that when you sleep with a new person, you're sleeping with every person that that person has slept with? Basically, I mean, in particular, and I think that kind of refers to at least um, the HPV population where it's a very common virus. It's easily transmitted from one person to another. And just because you have the virus doesn't mean you're going to have the outputs of it, warts, abnormal pap smears, um, problems. Men have warts on their penis too, um, or cervical cancer. But you still are a carrier of it. 
and that could be given to someone else. So do you recommend the shot? I, I, you know, I think this is a huge debate, and I think it is one of those things that I would have a strong discussion with someone about the benefits of it. You hear so many things about the risk and the concerns for giving the vaccine, but most people out there have never seen anybody die from cervical cancer. And it's a, it's a terrible way to die. It is one of those things that if you said, if I could have prevented it, would I have? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we're going around the world. I do a lot of missions trips and we're trying to screen for things that people outside of the United States are dying of more than we are because we do have the advantage of screening. But we have the advantage of not just screening, but preventing. And so I think it has to be a part of the discussion. Do women on a global level have pretty much the same concerns as we have? I think they have, in general, some similar concerns, but there are parts of the world where they are not necessarily seen as equivalent citizens. And so they have been either abused or put in a situation where they are not being taken care of in the way that we would expect to be taken care of in this country. Um, you know, I went to, I did mission trips in Rwanda and a lot of my patients were uh, victims of the genocide. And there were abhorrent things that were done to them that you would never even dream of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's surprising to a lot of women to know that these things are still happening around the world. We could do a whole show yeah. on that alone, which we will do at some point okay. in time. <laughs> so in wrapping up our discussion, one of the main points I want to make sure we get out is that you need to make sure you take care of yourself. You make sure you get your test, your tested for what you need to get tested for on mm -hmm. a yearly basis, mm -hmm. making sure that you're... Or more frequently. Yes, mm -hmm. making sure you're caring for the vagina mm -hmm. the way it should be cared mm -hmm. for. She's yours. You own her. You're responsible for her, so keep her safe. And some kind of odor is natural. Could be natural. Because somebody out here is blushing right now as we're talking about this, including me. But, yes. <laughs> but we have to. I know a lot of people are going to end up going to the bathroom right after this <laughs> and going doing a, a body check. <laughs> I am so glad to have you today. It I'm has been glad. my absolute pleasure. You were on with me once before, and I was so excited to have you back again. Thank you so for thank me you again. so, so very much for being here. Yeah, I appreciate here. your time and take, talking with me. Thank you. We've been talking to Dr. Brianna Walton, and she is a urogynecologist, and we've been talking about the big V word vagina. You've been listening to the, you've been watching rather, the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Have a great day.